So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned already, I'm Josie Rudolphy. Um, today we're going to be talking about farm worker safety and health. Uh, we were going to be talking specifically about uh, the health and safety of hired farm labor with a specific emphasis on hired farm workers, um, primarily Hispanic and Latino farm workers. We will start by describing the hired agricultural workforce and employment characteristics and demographics. Then we'll talk about the hazards that contribute to injuries and illnesses among farm workers, in addition to some of the social and political situations that further exacerbate health. Um, and then finally, I'm going to describe some, and I'm saying some with like a, an asterisk next to it because there are a lot of fantastic organizations um, that are uh, in our state, in Illinois specifically, providing resources, services, and or interventions to farm workers to improve safety and health. And I'm going to be discussing uh, a few of them that we work with uh, in Illinois Extension and others that are operating in the state. So with that, let's begin by talking about farm labor. The U.S. agricultural workforce has long consisted of a mixture of sort of two types of workers. So the first being self-employed farm operators and their family members. And when we think of the farmer, this is often who we're talking about. Um, perhaps people who are operating a family farm, somebody who's working as a self-employed full-time or not full-time farm operator. And these are reflected, these individuals are reflected in the yellow uh, portion of the bars on this, in this graph. And the other type that we often talk about are hired workers. And it's important to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate excuse me, these two groups, um, especially when we think about safety and health um, and occupational safety and health, because there are uh, certain exceptions um, to what would be considered federal or state labor or OSHA laws um, as to who is covered and who has to abide by said labor laws. Um, so we often, differentiate these two important groups when we think about agricultural safety and health. And if you see, um, both types of employment are have, have sort of been in a long-term decline since the 1950s, and this is due mostly in part to mechanization, which has contributed to increased, in, I should say, um, increased agricultural productivity and reducing the, while also reducing the need for labor. Um, and since about the 1990s, this is sort of stabilized. We think we sort of probably plateaued in, in where we can go, though probably not anymore, where we can go from a mechanization standpoint um, and where we still need to have human beings um, in, in fields and other places. But today we're gonna be discussing specifically the health and safety of the hired labor, uh, the sort of that, the, the orange portion of these bars um, and specifically farm workers. So hired farm workers make up less than 1% of all U.S. wage and salary workers, but they play an absolutely essential, essential role in, in U.S. agriculture. So they're found in a variety of occupations, including field crop workers, nursery workers, livestock workers. Uh, they serve as graders and sorters, inspectors, supervisors, and uh, hired farm managers. So the majority of uh, farm workers are wage and salary workers hired directly by farmers. Um, and that's what we see it mostly in Illinois. However, there's some, there are some uh, that are employees of agricultural service companies uh, and farm labor contractors. But you can see here on this slide, sort of uh, uh, the proportion of uh, agricultural workers who are in crops, operating in a crop support sort of role, and then working in livestock and livestock support. Many hired farm workers are foreign born uh, with a majority uh, coming from Mexico and countries in South America with varying levels or arrangements and, authoriz and authorizations to work in the United States. In recent years, farm workers have become more settled. So fewer are, mar are migrating long distances from home to work uh, and fewer are pursuing seasonal follow to crop types of migration work patterns. The number of young recent immigrants working in agriculture has also fallen. And as a result, the farm workforce is aging. And we see agriculture workforce aging in general. 
Wages for hired farm workers have gradually risen, but this is something we're going to talk um, in depth about in a couple of, sl of slides um, because it still contributes to uh, a substantial risk for health and safety. So within the population, it's expected, and, and these any statistics that I, I use today are uh, based on the best available data, and this is a relatively challenging um, workforce to um, quantify. As I mentioned, some are moving, um, others are sort of uh, perhaps avoiding participation in some types of surveys. Uh, but within the population, we expect that fit about 15% are migratory and about 85% are settled agricultural workers. We know that farm workers are employed in both metro and non-metro counties. Um, though we often think about agriculture, we think of more rural environments. So this is a, a very, I think, important and um, can be somewhat contentious topic to talk about the legal status of hired crop workers uh, between 1990 and 2000. Um, I think what's really important to emphasize is that agricultural workers support the estimated 1.2 trillion agricultural industry in the United States. And while there's a lot of conversations about uh, uh, who should be working and how they should be coming into the United States, um, eliminating agricultural workers or switching to less labor intensive types of crop systems can and have negatively impacted agricultural re regions um, and resulted in lost jobs, not just for agricultural workers, but other permanent uh, residents in those agricultural communities. There's a study out of Michigan State uh, that found the agricultural um, that found that agricultural workers contributed to over 23 million dollars to the state's economy um, and enabled farmers to produce higher value crops um, even after considering the costs of wages and in some cases housing. Also, um, though again it, it's quite contentious, strict immigration laws passed in some states have demonstrated um, the severe impact of farm labor shortages. Uh, we continue to see um, states enacting various sorts of laws that may preclude uh, farm labor from coming into the state. Um, and as a result, it has been, in some cases, they have um, seen uh, detrimental effects to their economy. And so you can see here that there continues to be a portion of agricultural workers that are uh, perhaps foreign born and unauthorized to work in the US. Um, but we do have systems uh, in place such that we can uh, have workers come to the US um, as authorized workers. And you can see that um, in some instances, um, uh, especially as of recent, we, we see um, US citizens and US born um, individuals continuing to contribute to the workforce. So this chart compares sex, age, and percent married by various agricultural work and all U.S. private age and salary workers. So that is on the far right. You can see across all ag occupations, workers are slightly more likely to be married. Um, this is not overly interesting, but do have some uh, important implications for health. So we know that people who are partnered or in partner type situations um, sometimes uh, have better health outcomes than people who are not, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we see workers in agricultural occupations uh, are slightly, though probably not significantly, older than private wage and salary workers. Um, and uh, people in agricultural occupations are less likely to be female. Though we do continue to see these demographics change. I mentioned um, agricultural workers are aging, we know that the farm owner operator is aging, um, and we know uh, that women are, females are playing a larger role uh, in farm labor, and they're also playing a larger role um, in, in farm owner operate, and as farm owners and operators, I should say. So from a demographic standpoint, um, the National Center for Farm Worker Health uh, estimates that there's approximately 3, 3 million agricultural workers in the US. Um, and so the demographic information that I'm presenting is from the 2019-2020 National Agricultural Worker Survey, or the NAS. Um, so the NAS does a nice job of, of, of surveying um, a sample of, of agricultural workers every year, um, and that we might have some of this uh, important demogra demographic information about the workforce. 
So a majority of workers, about 70% are foreign born um, and about 60% are coming, um, agricultural workers are born in Mexico. Um, about 60% of craft workers are male and 34% about are female. Um, and this has been a changing demographic uh, since the beginning of the NAS. We're seeing much more um, females participating in agricultural work. About 80% identify as Hispanic and over 60% um, indicate they're most comfortable conversing in Spanish. And that's not to say they don't have any um, uh, English language skills or any uh, proficiency there, but they're most comfortable conversing in Spanish. And that's something that becomes very, very important when we think about agricultural safety and health. Um, and the average completed education is ninth grade. Here, employment characteristics, again, where are uh, our farm workers working? And you can see um, uh, that fruits and nuts continue to employ the most farm workers, followed closely by horticulture, um, vegetables, and then field crops. And so when we think about Illinois specifically, um, we certainly see uh, uh, farm workers participating in some of our field crop uh, production, including specifically seed corn production, uh, as well as some of our vegetable and um, other sorts of specialty crops. We also know um, that there are a lot of farm workers working in uh, pork and dairy production in the U.S. Uh, and that workers are working an average of 39 weeks per year in agriculture. And what about Illinois? So um, we estimate there are approximately 50,000 farm workers uh, employed in Illinois annually. Uh, and we can we we see. Um, and benefit from uh, their work in the following types of industries. I've already mentioned seed corn production um, and some of our specialty crops, including blueberries in sort of central Illinois, um, apples, and of course, pumpkins, uh, which is one of our kind of leading specialty crops in Illinois, um, as well as pork production, especially in sort of the, the central and southern part of the state. We see um, farm workers employed in pork production. As well, then, as we more move north and certainly in the Chicago area, we used to have farm workers that are employed in nursery um, and landscaping businesses. So we're going to move into talking a little bit about um, injuries. And this is a cartoon, and I think uh, it's cute. And um, regardless of the status in agriculture, I think this rings quite true. Um, and that one, injuries are very common. Uh, Unfortunately, some do land workers in the hospital, but with that, the work does not stop or wait. Um, and so there are crops that need sprayed, um, livestock that need fed, uh, apples that need picks, pumpkins that need moved, et cetera. Um, those wait, it's not like a, a storefront where you can say we're closed for the next week. It's not necessarily like a manufacturing facility, whereas if we absolutely had to, we could shut things down. Um, crops, animals, et cetera, are going to continue to mature um, and unfortunately need tended to. There's just no off days for anybody. So when you think about some of the physical hazards, um, we know agriculture is a very hazardous industry. The fatal and non-fatal injury rate in agriculture far exceeds that of the all worker, all industry, fatal and non-fatal injury rates. And farm workers are exposed to a variety of, of physical hazards, which include livestock, um, livestock are large and very unpredictable. Uh, machinery and equipment, which is also large, though a little bit more predictable, um, machinery often uh, presents a number of blind spots and, of course, opportunity for malfunction. Um, I will note that regardless of labor status, machinery and livestock are some of the leading sources of injuries in agriculture. Um, and then we have uh, repetitive movements and awkward postures. So farm workers are, are often exposed to repetitive movement and awkward posture, especially in some of our specialty crop production where picking, pruning, um, and lifting are very common. This then leads into the types of injuries that we see. Um, so certainly some of the major causes of injury are, are transportation and machinery related, as well as bites or contact with animals. Um, and then we see a lot of cuts and piercings. Those fractures account for a majority of injuries, um, uh, broken bones um, can continue to be the leading source of injury among farm workers. 
And now we'll pivot to talk a little bit about illnesses, um, which uh, occupational health is a little bit more of my interest area. Um, and I think there are some really important um, health hazards to consider when we think about uh, farm workers. So farm workers um, are exposed to a myriad of health hazards. So we have warm and hot environments. Um, there's a lot of research to demonstrate um, uh, the warm and hot environments that agricultural workers have been exposed to in parts of Texas, of course, California, Florida, uh, and some of the Carolinas. And we're starting to see um, a lot more interest and concern for the warm, hot environments that are being presented in, in the Midwest, including Illinois. There's also chemical and pesticide exposure. Unfortunately, um, there have been a number of instances where um, uh, groups of workers have been uh, exposed, hopefully inadvertently, um, to pesticides. There are dusts. And then I mean, I list repetitive movements and awkward posture again here. And this is uh, kind of depends on which school of thought you um, were trained under as to whether uh, musculoskeletal conditions are an injury or an illness. We tend to talk about them uh, a lot, but repetitive movements and awkward posture contribute to chronic pain um, of the musculoskeletal system. So as I mentioned, farm workers in, endure um, high rates of toxic chemical injuries and skin disorders um, more than any other worker in the country. So we think about chemical exposure, we know symptoms of like nausea, vomiting, cramping, um, and then itching and burning of the eyes are some of the short-term or uh, acute effects of pesticide poisoning. Uh, and then there are long-term um, effects to chronic exposure, which can include, unfortunately, things like cancer, neurological disorders, reproductive effects, and depression. When we think about skin conditions, we see a lot of dermatitis um, linked to either pesticide exposure, but also other types of exposures, whether it be chemical agents and even plants. We know that there's a lot of uh, allergic reaction or, or dermatitis reaction to uh, various plants in the environment. Nationwide, nearly half of all farm workers have reported having had a skin rash as a function of their work. Uh, when we think about the hot or heat related illnesses, uh, we know farm workers are working all day uh, and in some cases not taking adequate breaks, um, probably a function of their work situation um, and maybe not being provided adequate water and or shade. Um, so they're experiencing heat related illnesses such as heat exhaustion and heat stroke, um, as well as dehydration. Among farm workers, heat stroke is a leading cause of work-related death, uh, and that's from the CDC. Farm workers are 20 times more likely to die as a result of heat-related illnesses than the rest of uh, the U.S. workforce. Uh, I mentioned musculoskeletal conditions. These are very common um, chronic pain in the back, knees, elbows, shoulders, uh, as a function of physically arduous work that many farm workers endure. And then finally, farm workers experience anxiety and depression at prevalence that exceed that of the general population. So there are various studies out of North Carolina, Nebraska, and Oregon um, that have all suggested upwards of 55% of Hispanic farm workers have what we would consider clinically significant symptoms of depression. So they're, they're screening um, individuals for anxiety or depression and finding that their responses uh, would indicate that they, they have a, like a clinically significant um, uh, case of depression. Both anxiety and depression have been associated with um, reported work-related stressors by farm workers, uh, wage, and acculturation. There are additional conditions that, ask as, that act as risk factors for safety and health among farm workers. Um, agricultural workers represent some of the most socially and economically disadvantaged uh, folks in the U.S. Uh, one thing that contributes to this is housing, although there are good examples of improving agricultural worker housing. Most agricultural worker housing that's provided by employers is often substandard and overcrowded. So, for example, a study out of North Carolina found that almost 80 percent of workers uh, reported living in crowded conditions. Um, regardless of whether the space actually complied with housing standards, it just felt very cramped and crowded. Um, and another study found um, uh, in California found that 2% of people surveyed, farm workers surveyed, reported living in uh, 
situations or environments that were not meant for human uh, habitation. This included things like tents or living in nearly the outdoors um, in converted buildings like old garages or something else, um, and perhaps even their vehicle. Farm workers also experienced chronic health conditions disproportionately higher than the general population, um, and unfortunately, often without adequate health care um, or disease management. And some of these chronic conditions include diabetes and hypertension, and uh, these conditions exacerbate work-related illnesses and injuries. And then finally, wage. So according to the uh, most recent NAWS, again, National Agricultural Worker Survey results, um, almost 20% of agricultural worker families had family income um, at levels that were below the national poverty uh, guideline. Uh, they report an average hourly wage of less than $14. Um, and in some instances, uh, workers are paid by the hour, though there are some instances where workers are paid by the piece. Um, and using a piece rate as a basis for payment um, the relatively uncommon um, is quite hazardous for the, for the uh, agricultural worker. Um, this encourages people to work quickly. Uh, this encourages people to not take adequate breaks, to not focus on hydration, um, because if you're being paid by how much you pick and weigh, uh, you're obviously motivated to just pick as much as possible. Uh, and then in addition, agricultural workers rarely have access to workers' compensation, um, disability compensation, and other sorts of employment benefits that a lot of us appreciate. I do want to mention the adverse wage, adverse effect wage rates. So the adverse effect wage rate is specific to H-2A workers, and this is the agricultural guest worker program uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so H-2A employers must pay the higher of the state or federal minimum wage. So if a state has elected a higher minimum wage than the federal weight, rate, excuse me, they must pay that. Um, or the regional average farm wage that's observed by the Farm Labor Survey, um, which is administered by NAS. They have to pay whichever is the highest of these. Um, and the goal here is to ensure that H-2A employment, so, so inviting workers into your state or in your community to work, um, does not negatively, and, and whatever wage you pay, um, is a wage that is not going to negatively affect the domestic farm worker wage. Um, so we can't pay farm workers so little uh, such that it disrupts sort of the eco economics of the community. Um, however, you can see what this adverse effect wage rate is in each of these states. Um, this is from 2023. And if you know what your state's minimum wage is, um, you can decide as to whether it would, the farm worker would be making the minimum wage or the adverse effect wage rate. Um, but what's really important here is that these um, wages. Uh, imagine trying to support yourself and your family um, uh, on the wages that are presented on this slide or what you, you know for your state's um, minimum wage or federal, label, federal minimum wage if you were to elect into that instead. Uh, so they're still horrifically underpaid um, despite being absolutely vital to agricultural production in the United States. Um, and there are thankfully a lot of people who are working um, to advocate for higher wages. Um, but as you can imagine, it is, um, a, for whatever reason, it is an uphill battle. And I think this just really highlights the discrepancy be cut between the average US non-farm wage and the average on-farm wage. So while we think that the adverse effect wage rate might protect farm workers from low wage, you can see that this is really not the case. Um, when we compare uh, the orange bar of US non-farm wage versus the blue bar of average on-farm wage. So I think this really, again, just highlights the disparity in 
uh, wage between these industries. I should say between agriculture and all other industries. So with that, we're going to uh, transition into thinking or talking about um, some barriers to care. So as a function, there are a number of barriers that, that agricultural workers um, unfortunately experience um, in seeking health care and participating uh, in the health care system. And I will say, I um, grew up in the U.S. I uh, feel like I'm pretty educated, and I even I can admit that the health care, that health care is very challenging to navigate regardless of who you are. Um, but unfortunately, there are some, some barriers um, that exist um, that further prevent or preclude farm workers from being able to participate in healthcare. Um, some of that is a function of their work and perhaps legal status. So they may not have access, like I mentioned previously, to workers' compensa compensation and or health insurance. Um, in the event that healthcare services are available or health insurance is available, they might not be accessible due to lack of transportation or inability to get I should say are very long wait periods for an appointment. We see that in rural areas especially. Um, but we don't often think about transportation being a, a huge barrier. A lot of us grew up with vehicles. We, we drive or we, we have public transportation available to us, but that's not necessarily the case for farm workers. So for example, for H2A workers, um, many rely on transportation that's provided by their employer and employers may eagerly transport people to or from work and home every day, um, however, may not prioritize transporting um, or providing transportation to clinics um, or appointments. We know that some farm workers are still um, migratory, so meaning they maybe follow a crop or a work season through state or region. Uh, and this transient nature makes it very challenging and perhaps even impossible to establish a medical home or to establish uh, a place where you continuously go to seek care, somebody that has your health records on, on hand. Um, and this makes it very, very challenging then to participate in uh, preventative screenings, you know, when they, when they come due. Uh, and then also makes it really challenging to manage um, chronic health conditions, such as hypertension or diabetes. When healthcare is available, there may also be challenges in communicating with providers and staff. So as previously noted, um, over 60% of farm workers uh, in the NAS survey said that they prefer to converse in Spanish. Um, but we know that in rural areas, there may not be Spanish speaking uh, uh, physicians, healthcare providers and others on staff, which just would create a lot of challenge um, in trying to navigate a health system uh, and seek any, and actually be able to absorb any sort of information. Uh, finally, there are some qualitative studies and even conversations with farm workers that in, have unveiled fears around being uh, reported or deported, regardless of regardless of legal or visa status. Um, some people are worried about uh, mentioning. Um, their health or injury to a employer for fear that they'll just be fired um, and perhaps be left without a job. Um, there are others who are who are um, less interested or, or nervous about participating in healthcare um, for fear of being again deported. And this is regardless of their legal status or visa status. So, for example, I spent two years in Central Wisconsin um, in one of the counties with the most dairy cows in the state. Uh, and we had a large um, farm worker population. And the political dialogue and rhetoric around immigration um, in like 2017 to 2019 really invoked a lot of fear among farm workers, even those that, that were in the US legally, that perhaps even pursuing citizenship, um, these sorts of conversations that we allow to happen can be really damaging. Um, not only to the health and safety, but then of course the mental health uh, of again, this really, really important pivotal workforce. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the organizations in Illinois that are providing resources and services to farm workers. And I will start by saying again, there are thankfully a lot of people in this space who are doing amazing work. I'm gonna mention some of the organizations that I'm, I'm uh, a part of and working with, 
um, but this is certainly not all encompassing. Um, so if I if I leave anything out, it's certainly not intentional. The first group I'm really excited to talk about, this is the Great Lakes Center for Farmworker Health and Wellbeing. This is one of 12 federally funded National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Agricultural Safety and Health Centers of Excellence. So this is funded by NIOSH, um, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Um, and the Great Lakes Center priorities are to provide outreach and conduct high quality research to improve the safety and health of farm workers in Illinois. So this is officially at the University of Illinois Chicago with partnerships um, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, as well as uh, a couple of farm work, a, a number of farm worker serving organizations in the state, um, including Community Health Partnerships in Illinois, which I'll mention um, and talk more about uh, Illinois Migrant Council, Legal Aid Chicago, and others. So the center is in its second year. However, in year one, we connected with over 600 farm workers at outreach events in the community. Um, some of the priorities for research include injury and illness surveillance, identifying barriers and opportunities uh, to heat related illness prevention, and developing culturally appropriate survey tools. Some of our priorities for outreach include the development of pesticide safety materials for farm workers um, and uh, assisting employers by translating materials, um, safety and health materials that were originally in English uh, to Spanish so they might be uh, more easily uh, used by farm workers. Here's the website if you want to learn more um, about some of the work we're doing and if you want to connect. If any of uh, this interests you, please reach out to me and I can help connect you. If, if I'm not working directly with the organization, we certainly have um, partners who could get you connected with um, uh, anybody you learn about here today. The other uh, group I want to talk about is Illinois Extension. So within Illinois Extension, we have a number of, of, of subgroups that are providing resources and or services to farm workers. So I direct Illinois AgriAbility, um, and AgriAbility works to serve people in uh, agricultural occupations who experience disability. So we provide resources and services such that they could remain active in agriculture if that's what they would like to do. So we provide a lot of health education and resources as well as direct services. So um, if somebody is experiencing age or injury related disability um, and is looking for uh, workarounds or other sorts of interventions that might um, make work easier, uh, we do on site or on farm assessments and then help navigate uh, workers and farmers through um, uh, interventions and other sorts of strategies. I also want to mention the Integrated Health Disparities Extension Corps, and this is led by um, Dr. Margarita Turan Garcia. Uh, she has a number of initiatives um, that include, uh, and, and farm workers are certainly included in um, some of her audiences, uh, but she and her team of educators um, offer programming around um, child and adult obesity prevention education, some social support programming, one of which I'll talk about more on the next slide. Um, and she's also working on developing cultural humility training for healthcare providers. Um, again, so that healthcare providers can better connect with uh, uh, farm workers and provide uh, a culturally appropriate care. Community Health Partnerships of Illinois is a federally qualified, uh, patient-centered, comprehensive, primary care uh, setting in six different sites around the state, primarily in central and northern parts of the state. Um, and they are, uh, their priority is to provide welcoming and responsive um, care that meets the cultural and language needs of the communities they serve. So they don't explicitly serve farm workers, but this is an important population they do serve. Um, and if they estimate they serve approximately 8,000 migrant and seasonal farm workers and their families annually um, across their 37 county sort of service area. They do have six different clinic sites as well as two mobile clinics that they can take out on the road. So CHP or Community Health Partnership of Illinois provides primary care services, um, dental services and behavioral health services through either their clinic network or again their mobile clinic. And you can see um, uh, the two photos on the left 
Um, obviously, one's just the back of the clinic, which you can see the mobile clinic, I should say. Um, but the picture towards the bottom, you can see what the mobile clinic looks like. So these are quite sophisticated um, and allow for uh, various types of health screenings and other sorts of, of um, primary health to be out in the community, which is really, really important. Um, these vans, or excuse me, mobile clinics can visit housing sites, work sites, and other um, spaces where people gather uh, to provide some of those critical health screenings and um, immunizations. Uh, the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center is one of four USDA funded farm and ranch stress assistance networks. Um, the North Central is a 12 state region. Um, and one of our goals is to provide stress and mental health related programs and resources to farm workers. Um, and one example uh, of what we've been up to um, is from my colleague, Dr. Athena Ramos at the Central State Center for Agricultural Safety and Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And Dr. Ramos has been working, uh, has been focused on farm worker safety and health for a very long time um, and recently implemented uh, Bienvenido, which is a support group uh, welcoming program uh, to farm workers in Nebraska. And this is a uh, an inter it's like a nine week long intervention um, where people gather and there's sort of a nine weeks worth of curriculum um, that people gather in the same space and it's really developed and designed to be responsive to Latino cultural no norms. And so this is not a program that was actually like translated into Spanish, um, but this is like like many um, mental health or wellness type programs are, but this is something that was actually developed in Spanish. So it very much um, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It, it was developed with um, specific cultural and language norms um, of the population, which I think is really important. And um, like I said, it's a nine week course. And I say course, it's, it's definitely not classroom based. Like this is very much in the community. Um, Dr. Athena Ramos and her team um, uh, meet with people in community spaces and they have they, they cook together and they laugh together, but they also talk about um, challenges, stressors, they talk about coping mechanisms, um, and they help identify community resources to improve a sense of belonging um, and to improve social support. Um, and we're really excited to be bringing this program to Illinois. Um, Margarita Tron Garcia and her team uh, have been trained as instructors in this um, and are bringing it into Illinois in the next year. And we're really, really excited for that. We know that support groups and building social support um, can really help um, instill hope in people. It, it creates shared common bonds and sort of similar experiences, obviously provides support um, and then increases a sense of belonging, which we know is really important. If you have, uh, if you're anybody who's new to an environment, um, there's, there's a period of, of acculturation to that. Um, and we know that farm workers are especially um, marginalized in, in that they may not have resources and services available to them. Uh, they're adapting to a new, a new culture and new types of norms. Um, and so the, the goal of this type of group or the Bienvenido program is to really like build a sense of belonging. Um, and hopefully, hopefully communities are reciprocating um, in that sort of, that sort of welcoming. A couple of other organizations that are um, operating in the state or, or the region and even nationally. Um, Shawnee Health is a federally qualified health center that, that operates similarly to CHP, though it's in the southern part of the state. Um, the Illinois Migrant Council also provides resources and services um, to farm workers across the state. Legal Aid Chicago um, helps uh, provides free legal services uh, and, and uh, helps organize a lot of initiatives to H-2A workers specifically, um, making sure that workers know what their rights are as H-2A workers, making sure that they have access to adequate housing, um, transportation, and others. The National Center for Farm Worker Health is absolutely outstanding and some have state-based programs, um, but even if without a state-based program, uh, they offer a lot of information and resources for farm workers. And then finally, I'll make mention of the Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, this is a really great uh, nationwide network that's 
really focused on providing training and education to clinicians so that clinicians may better meet the needs um, of farm workers across, across the country. And like I mentioned, this is just uh, a couple of organizations that are operating in the, in the state and in the US, and there are many, many more, thankfully, because this is um, a, a population that I like, I've, I've said before is so critically important to agricultural production in the US, um, but they're incredibly vulnerable to injury and illness as a function of both the jobs that they do um, and also um, uh, social and political factors at play um, that are perhaps uh, creating unnecessary barriers to um, uh, their ability to lead healthy, safe, and fulfilling um, lives while they're here. So with that, I would really like to thank the FarmDoc sponsors, TIAA, CoBank, Compier Financial, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit of Illinois, Growmark, Illinois Corn, and the Illinois Soybean Association for um, supporting not just this webinar, but all of the FarmDoc webinars. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our educational partners, which of course the College of Agricultural Consumer and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois, uh, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics, and Illinois Extension. So thank you so much for joining us today. Should you need any more information about FarmDoc, you can use the QR code there. Um, again, this will be on YouTube. Uh, so if you're interested, um, you can find us there. There's also a lot more information there, a lot of great um, archived webinars there and five minute FarmDoc uh, videos. So please subscribe to our channel. With that, um, I'm gonna open it up. I'm gonna open the chat up for any questions. I see that I don't think any have come in, uh, but should there be any questions now, I would invite those. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and remember to please respond to um, the evaluation when you receive it at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much.